Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Firewalls Don't Stop Dragons. I'm your host, Kerry Parker. Today, we have episode 324 for May 15th, 2023. Got a great interview for you today. We're going to be talking to Vincent Hendricks, who's one of the co-authors of the book Ministry of Truth, which came out last year. It's a great book. It's about social media and its influence upon us. And so I've got a lot of great questions about that for him today. Just a couple of quick things before we start. First of all, I got a lot of positive feedback on last week's tip of the week. A lot of people enjoyed that tip about how to block annoying web pop-ups and really just about any annoying JavaScript widget, which accounts for a lot of the web today. It's a really powerful and very useful technique. So uh, if you missed that episode, or better yet, maybe if you want to just check out the blog article, just go to firewallsdontstopdragons.com. It's probably the most uh, recent article there, depending on when you go. But it uses a great feature of uBlock Origin that, uh, if you haven't used it before, is really, really powerful and handy. I've been really thinking I might need to do an extended sort of tip of the week or maybe just kind of a informational podcast segment dedicated to authentication. There's just so many things going on right now with with pass keys. But, you know, I think people still need to understand some more basics, too, about passwords and password managers and two-factor authentication and and all those things. But pass keys in particular have been very confusing. The rollout has been slow. It's it's not obvious yet how it's supposed to work. It's got some cons. I mean, there's there's some pretty obvious pros, but there's some serious cons as well. And uh, there's some things that actually might sink the whole effort, which is kind of a shame. But anyway, I, I think I might need to, to dedicate a pretty big segment to some show, maybe when we have a slow news week, <laughs> which may never happen uh, the way things are going. But uh, we shall see. The Amazon and Apple review counts are slowly growing. Thank you so much to everybody who has posted a really nice review of the podcast or the book. That really does make a huge difference. So uh, again, that is wonderful. Thank you so much for doing that. And of course, the more the merrier. They really do make a big difference. So if you've read the book and like it, if you're really enjoying the podcast, Amazon and Apple Music are the best places to leave reviews because that's where most people see them. So I would appreciate that very, very much. Okay, so today, again, we have a great interview. I'll be talking to Vincent F. Hendricks. He's a really interesting guy, a very animated guy. You'll actually hear <laughs> hear him being animated uh, in the background a little bit during the during the interview. But we had a lot to talk about. Social media is just, you know, it's just a real scourge today, unfortunately, for society and democracy. It's got problems. I mean, it had a lot of promise, still does, honestly. There are ways we could fix this. There are definitely ways we can make this better. But we need we need to get on that because right now it is just a disaster. And of course, the title of the book, Ministry of Truth, is a reference to uh, 1984 by George Orwell. Though, of course, in the book, this was a government agency putting out propaganda and the people kind of knew it. And there were these telescreens that could watch you while you watched them. And, you know, you're supposed to absorb the government cup propaganda but even Orwell didn't foresee the fact that the telescreens would actually be something you could fit in your pocket or purse and that the citizens slash consumers would willingly take them with them everywhere they go, 24-7, even to the bathroom. And that the new speak or double think, uh, some, some of these terms that were coined by Orwell, uh, would really be coming from private corporations more than the government. Anyway, Vincent will do a much better job talking to you about that. And we've got him right here. So let's get to the interview. Vincent F. Hendricks, author of The Ministry of Truth, Big Tech's Influence on Facts, Feelings, and Fictions, is Professor of Formal Philosophy at the University of Copenhagen. He is the Director of the Center for Information and Bubble Studies, funded by Carlsberg Foundation. Welcome to the show, Vincent. Thank you, sir. Um, so let's let's start with the basics. What was the basic thesis of your book, and you know what compelled you and your co-author, Camilla, to write it? Well, first of all, let's take the last one first. I mean, it's sort of a natural conclusion to a trilogy. I wrote a book in uh, in 2016. It was called Infostorms. Why do we like explaining individual behavior on the social net? That's about us. Then there is a book about the markets, which we're in, the information market and the attention economy. And then the last one here, the Ministry of Truth, is pretty much about big tech's influence on both of these two former books, if you wish. So from that perspective, it was a natural continuation. Another one was that there were a couple of things that were being said about big tech and that big tech executives were saying. So Mark Zuckerberg years ago said, I don't think that Facebook nor any other platform should be the arbiter of truth. Mm. And so that's sort of stuck. And you can say a lot about uh, big tech, but they are the arbiters of truth insofar as both qualitatively and quantitatively, 
they do have a big say in what we see. So it might not be in terms of propositional truth, but it has to do in terms of narrative truth, what comes out in our feed, what we like, how things are ordered. So they do have a role to play here. And at the same time, they will also say, well, you know, safeguarding democracy is above our pay grade. Mm -hmm. And now then, of course, that we had uh, the insurrection. Well, that was in part, at least, stimulated by big tech. And you can say a lot about uh, Donald J. Trump, but he was publicly elected. Now, is he or is he not allowed a voice in public space, which is not on private hands, quote unquote? And had you asked the Enlightenment philosophers whether or not the uh, the public space should be a private hands, they would have a resounding no as an answer, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So they do have play a big part in some very, very fundamental issues pertaining to everything from democracy on one hand to who gets heard on the other hand and who basically directs the information market and the attention economy. And that was basically, those were the drivers of writing this book. So content moderation, particularly, you know, at scale with companies like Facebook and YouTube and TikTok, it is notoriously difficult. We've talked about it several times in the show. I've interviewed several people about this, and it's really hard to find solutions. So, but things have changed a little bit from scandals, Cambridge Analytica, and some of the things that have happened. I know that some of these companies have tried to make some changes. So maybe give us an update. Like, what is the current state of moderation today on major platforms? And, you know, what sort of mechanisms are they employing today to enforce their policies? Well, first of all, I think it's fair to say that, as you're, you're absolutely right, sir, I mean, things have been changing, and that's only for the, at least for a start, for the better. One of the things that we found out of the Facebook files that Francis Haugen actually was uh, whistleblowing on, which we might also have been touching on about the show, was that actually during the 2020 election, Facebook or Meta was actually able to install friction strategies that made it a little harder to proliferate fake news and misinformation on the platforms. And they actually installed those, they kept those as long as the as long as the election was going on, and as soon as they that was not going on anymore, they dropped those kind of right. strategies because it was bad for it was bad for engagement, it was bad for traffic, and so it was bad for ad sales in the end, right? right. So they actually do have certain automated strategies that will actually work, and we have also developed some which we might get into later. But just to say, so things are going on. And of course, they have their community standards. They try to enforce them as much as they can. But there's way too much information being out there all just on a daily basis. Of course, you can't have manual content, content moderation. So right. what they're doing or trying to do is to do more and more on an AI based uh, on an AI based basis. But of course, there's a lot you will miss. You will miss you will miss intention or you may satire. There are a lot mm -hmm. of things that you will have to still actually go in and probably check to see whether or not. And some of these also going to be based on interpretation. Yeah. So basically, I think it's fair to say that they are really still struggling with this. And as you know, as of today, Elon Musk announced his vision of a, a truth GPT. Now, an artificial intelligence that could actually track the truth for us as humans hmm. and put us in the context of the universe. Now, that is a grand ambition. It's not realizable, I must say. But basically, they're trying to enforce their community standards between, on one hand, manual intervention, and then, and then of course, more or less AI-based interventions. But, I mean, fair to say is that they are running behind on a daily basis. It's like Achilles and the Torturons. I had forgotten that Facebook had actually put in place some protections around the election and then turned them off. I'd forgotten they'd done that. But if there's some automation involved. There's some sort of, they've already got some algorithmic AI kind of things that are looking for maybe keyword content or maybe nude images. You know, they've probably got some of that automated, which you have to. At the, I mean, these are billions of users, right? There's just no, sure. as you said, there's, it's impossible for a human to police everything. But then the flip side of this, they crowdsource some of that too, right? There are ways that people can flag questionable content, which which bubbles it up and brings it to, to the attention of the of the moderation teams at these companies. Is, does that sum up the basic state of the art right now? Or is there anything more to it than that? Well, as far as we know, right? I mean, we don't exactly know what goes on behind mm -hmm. the scenes. And of course, if you're moderating so much on a daily basis, it's not everything that you will tell the public as to how you do it, exactly how you do it. For another reason, because 
you might not do it consistently, right? Mm-hmm. You might not, you might do it some places rather than others. You might actually also ever so often say, okay, so we're going to be worried about, say, eating disorders in, 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 in youth, say, right? So we have a focus on that because there's a public focus on that. Now, if that changes, we might change mm-hmm. the same for misinformation as we 2020 election. They had focus on that because all ever since 2016, that was a big issue for Congress. It was a big issue for the public. So they had to attend to that matter. So chances are they're going to be a little bit following the zeitgeist as to what will gain traction as to content moderation and follow those. But of course, they are a function of zeitgeist, so they may change and they might change arbitrarily from one minute to the next. So it's fair to say that that across the board, it's pretty much as you describe it. And then I think uh, then I think that they have certain editorial policies installed for what they're looking at at particular times. And they might also do something proactively that we are not aware of. And the other thing that I think a lot of people don't understand, or maybe some people suspect, uh, is that the the moderation is not judiciously applied. It's not always equal. There are, for instance, we've learned about, I think it was XCheck or something like that that Facebook had, where there were VIPs that were exempt from the rules or got different rules somehow. And and then in different countries, like when you look at like Africa and other places where there's maybe no moderation at all, as compared, you know, we're all used to maybe West, the Western worldview of what, what's going on. How fairly, that's a, that's a maybe a loaded term to use, but how equally are these things applied to various users and in various locales? We don't know. But, uh, but, but, but a good measure of most of this is follow the money, right? So, so one of the reasons why you had this X check was that there were certain uh, high profiles on, the, uh, on, on Meta's platforms that generate a lot of traffic and uh, they got special conditions. And so Mark Zuckerberg was one, Donald Trump was another, uh, one of the, uh, Neymar, the football player was a third, et cetera, et cetera. So, so some 5,000 accounts that got special treatments. And if you look at some of many of those 5,000 accounts, they were the ones who were generating a lot of traffic. They sure. were generating a lot of engagement. And so uh, there was a, a at least a pecuniary incentive not to block them or given the same conditions as others. And so chances are, if you're looking at the way that the money is being generated, there is something to be said to the extent that that big nodes, big nodes in the network that generates a lot of attention and a lot of engagement and uh, big purveyors in this information market, if you want to optimize your, your, your business model, you're going to cut some slack, right? Because right. it's advantageous for your model. And so far, and that's exactly Francis Haugen's point. So far, at least when it comes to Meta, is her point that they'll take profit any day of the week week and twice on Sunday over any other concern. Yeah, right. That's her. I'm quoting her on this. And chances are that some of the others are going to follow suit because if they don't do it, somebody else will. So if it's not going to end up in a zero sum game, they'll follow the suit in much the same way. Now, much of the content that we're being fed on social media today is governed by opaque algorithms, algorithms we don't really know what's going on there. And, and they're designed primarily to maximize engagement, you know, which maximizes ad revenue, right? Because these are all ad companies. This is the attention economy that you talk about in the book. Mm-hmm. And even Tristan Harris, uh, you quoted Tristan Harris saying, you know, sure. it's not because anyone is evil or has had bad intentions. It's because the game is getting attention at all costs. So, you know, <laughs> these algorithms seem to unfortunately show us a lot of bad stuff. Do you believe that these algorithms are actually biased in that way to show us bad things or are they just neutral and, you know, we're just naturally drawn to content that is bad for us and for society. And so we kind of manifest what we see. Well, again, I think the argument is the same as before and it's exactly the same as Tristan Harris's argument. You follow the money again, right? So from that perspective, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Now, they are biased as to engagement. Even a lot of the counters are set up that way. Right. So, for instance, also during the Facebook files, Francis Haugen showed that there was an internal score system. And we also have this in the book that bad content or bad in the sense that it made us angry, got an internal score of five, whereas a like got an internal score of one. Hmm. So you were basically jacking up the anger in the feed. And why? Because it creates engagement. Right. So basically, you're plugging into what's called our activity mobilizing sentiments which we discuss a lot in the book. And those are basically, if you ask a psychologist about our emotions, they will say, well, they're at least cut across two axes. Are the emotions positive? Are they negative? Are they activity mobilizing or are they activity demobilizing? And they then various emotions will put themselves different places on the scale. So if I write out on the web, I'm so happy today. Then, of course, although happiness is a, a positive sentiment, the fact that I'm happy does not 
it, it does not in any way animate you to do anything. So it might be positive, but it's not activity mobilizing. Whereas if you proliferate anger, whenever I get angry, I want to do something. What do I do online? I share, I click, I like, I create engagement, right? So there is something to be said about feeding into our activity mobilizing sentiments. Why? Because they create engagement. And we have a lot of negative activity mobilizing sentiments. Anger is one. Indignation is another one, et cetera, et cetera. Fear, mm -hmm. fear works really well. And so if you can if you can feed into those, then you got yourself a gameplay. And of course, insofar as some of the algorithm can detect that, at least there is a financial incentive to do so and proliferate the information. That's answer number one. Answer number two is this. Namely, we saw, and of course, TikTok has been in the, the focal eye for a lot of people lately. And one of the things that we saw that Tristan Harris also has been commenting on very recently is the fact that there are sort of two versions of TikTok. There is what he's called the opium version of TikTok. That's the one that's being fed to the Western world. Mm -hmm. And then there is the Chinese version of TikTok. And the name of that particular platform escapes me at the moment. Mm. However, you can only use that for 40, 40 minutes a day. Right. And a lot of the information and material you will find there is educational material. It is not the same thing. So they, they, they talk about the spinach version. That's the one that they mm. use in China. And then there's the opium version. That's the one that's being fed to the rest of the world. And why? Well, <laughs> think of why. Because exactly those French fries are the ones that we like to gobble down very quickly and it's good for business. Right. Yeah, that, that, that is fascinating that of all the social media ones, TikTok has a different version in their native country. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's fascinating. Possibly because they know that this is my, might not be the best thing to consume too much of. In the same way that Steve Jobs didn't have, his kids didn't have iPhones, right? <laughs> right, right. So, so I'm going to play devil's advocate a little bit with you on some of these things. For instance, you know, social media is often cited as causing harms to society in, in odd ways that like body image anxiety in teens and, you know, generally causing people to feel that their lives are lacking. You know, they see their friends taking these amazing vacations and they're all, you know, all these wonderful perks, uh, uh, sure. people portraying lives as being perfect. But, but this was also said of magazines, right? With airbrushed models on the covers. We were certain that that was, I mean, that was a problem, <laughs> you know, and yeah. even to unrealistic portrayals of family life on TV, you know, maybe back in the fifties where it was, you know, father knows best and things like that. But, but even, it goes the other way too. So it's just really just a new form of the same thing, or is this fundamentally different somehow? Okay. So there are two points of this. First of all, the same goes for fake news. We wrote a book, The Reality Lost Book, a couple of years ago. And of course, we can find, you can trace fake news back to as long as we've had a press. Right, so right. The, the concept is not new as such, right? Now, of course, what is different now is the infrastructure, uh, the information infrastructure on one hand and speed on the other. That we have never seen to this extent, right? So that means that it proliferates a lot more than it, what it has been done before. And then, of course, you have a much better idea of where the target groups are. You have to realize one thing, which is very important, and we realize just way too late. I mean, the entire point is not only to sell ads. Of course, you do that. But what might, at least as important, possibly more important, is this, all the data you collect about the users. Mm. And that's behavioral data that you collect about how they actually do behave. Now, all that data, everything is being locked. They might not be used, but it's all logged, right? It's all being scraped off the web by the big social platforms. And why? Well, because in the end, all behavioral data is credit information. In the sense of saying, if I can predict the way in which you will behave based on your data or based on your history, et cetera, then basically I know what you're worth online in terms of your interest, in terms of how often you come back. So all data is credit data about the users. And you can use that for control. That's what you do very upfront in China. So the entire social credit system is based on the idea that you log people's behavior and then you modify people's behavior to the ideas of the system. Yeah, uh, That means the political system. Mm -hmm. And then basically you use it both for control, but also for possibly prediction of what your user are interested in. Now, the prediction part is, of course, intact in liberal democracies, too. It would be very nice to know what the users want before they know it themselves. And, of course, uh, Eric Smith, the old boss of, 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 of Google, said in 2011, he said, I don't think that people really want to search Google. I think people want Google to tell them what they should do next. Mm -hmm. 
So there you have it, right? And so from that perspective, it's not only the asset, it's also the data about the users, which in the end is credit information about you as a user. And there are a million ways from Sunday that you can use that particular information. So basically to answer your question, I think it's fair to say that we have always had fake news. We have always had problems about self-imaging, et cetera, but we have not had the infrastructure to this extent, to this speed, with the added bonus of people engaging with that will provide you with credit information about them. That model is new. And that's what we get from Susanna Zuboff's book, Surveillance Capitalism in 2019, namely the idea that as humans, we have always been capitalizing and cannibalizing on something. But in the 21st century, we sort of looked around to see what's left right of us to capitalize on. And then we put a mirror up in front of ourselves and go, how about ourselves? That's a good idea. Let's do that. Let's capitalize on our cognitive resource most valuable to us, namely our attention. And the rest is history. And that's four years ago. <laughs> and even before you talk about fake news, even before the Internet became a thing, I mean, for, for many, many years, we think back you know, lovingly to the Walter Cronkite days of broadcast news and how there were only three there were only three TV stations in the, on, on, in the planet for a long time. And, and they were all outgunning each other to, to be the arbiters of truth. And but they really wanted to be truth. It was a loss leader. It wasn't about money. And then somewhere along the line, I, I personally blame you know, probably cable 24 hour news where they had to fill every second <laughs> became infotainment yeah. and, you know, and then if it bleeds, it leads. And then sure. with the internet, it became clickbait. So these things do go. <laughs> You're competing for eyeballs, right? Right. This whole ad economy is really behind a lot of this stuff. So Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, yeah, you know, these are all private companies and as such, they are free to police their content as they see fit. And, you know, and right. yet, you know, due to the massive global reach of these platforms, many like to think of them as this quote unquote public square. You kind of talked about that earlier. Sure. Uh, where the founding fathers not really seeing that this, you know, this could be a possibility, you know, and so I think some people because of that, because of the, the, the massive reach of these platforms, these are where everybody is, you know, they feel that any moderation amounts to censorship or suppression of speech. So, you know, setting aside, I think the pretty clear cut legal rights that these private companies have for moderating, you know, whatever they want. Do you think that they, nevertheless, is there an ethical or a moral responsibility to allow, you know, otherwise illegal speech? I mean, you still can't shout fire in a crowded theater or whatever. There's still limits. But even just because they don't like it, should should these private companies who are legally able to do so still kind of back off on some level to allow, quote unquote, free speech? Well, that's... Because well, that's, that's, where, that's where people are, right? So no, how I else totally would... agree. Exactly. I mean, look... Let's back up for a second. Why do we take the public square to be an important democratic pillar? And the reason is this, the reason why people gather at, at, the, at the Washington Memorial, the reason why they gather at City Hall Square is because the only access criteria to be there is to be a citizen, a, a, a part of the democratic community. That's all the access that is required there. And that's the reason why deliberative democracy works really well in the public square because that's exactly where you could flag your disagreement with the leading party or whatever it is that you disagree with or you find community with other people that you do agree with. The point being that the only criteria for access is basically you being a citizen to exercise your freedom of speech, point blank. And there is no criteria other than that. Now, of course, as you correctly point out, the public square is less now a, a physical manifestation is an information infrastructure, mm. but it's an information infrastructure provided by, owned by, and controlled by private enterprising. Right. Now, neither the founding fathers nor the pioneers of democracy of the Enlightenment period had thought of this possibility exactly, right? And so from that perspective, if you presented them with this idea today, they would probably say, no, we don't, that's not a public square anymore because apparently some people are more, everybody, you know, as, as you say, an animal for everybody's equal, but apparently some people are more equal than others, mm -hmm. uh, especially have the money or control the infrastructure. Now, so on the one hand, we want to keep the idea of private enterprising. Yet on the other hand, they have started to capitalize or monopolize, if you wish, what we take a democratic pillar to be, namely public space. Mm -hmm. So yet we are in a fix between, in liberal democracies, we are in a fix between a democratic idea of the general access to the public square for which nobody owns except for we the people, 
Yet, on the other hand, we want to protect private enterprising at the same time. And the, pay, and, the and the social media platforms have deliberately not decided which part to go because that gives them the most the most freedom of all. Namely, we are not media. We are not safeguarding democracy. We are just providing bandwidth. But in this day and age, providing bandwidth is just more than just digging the cables in. It's basically about controlling the information market and given run by an attention economy. So it's an extremely powerful thing. So so they can say on one hand, this is private enterprising, but yet I think there is a move among lawmakers and the general public that they are so big now that they have to take some sort of democratic responsibility mm-hmm. or at least take some, some make some kind of decision as to what we are. And that they are extremely, what should I say, hesitant towards doing exactly. And if they don't do it, I'm sure that lawmakers are going to tell them exactly how they feel about it and regulate accordingly. But that might be something that people will go, we don't want the government to regulate what private enterprises should do. And yet on the other hand, oh, but they control public space, so maybe it's okay. See, this is not a very easy problem to solve exactly. And I think we are still trying to find our way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of the more pithy phrases I've seen that kind of represents this to me is that it's freedom of speech, not freedom of reach. And, you know, right. and so a lot of these platforms, it's the reach really that, the, that, that you're, you're wanting here, that this global, I mean, there are people with millions of followers on some of these programs that have obviously a lot of more influence. But the other aspect of this, though, I think that makes it fundamentally different is, and we don't have time to get into Section 230 today, but, but this notion of, the, I mean, Facebook in the old day was just a place for you to go post stuff. But now, because they've kind of put their thumb on the scales, they've got these algorithms that highlight some things and downplay others. Sure. There's a lot of people that feel that they put the thumb on the scales, that they're actually tilting this they're they're warping this it's not just a free and egalitarian place where anybody's ideas can be found because that's not really true so how do you think that plays into this how does that affect their moral or ethical obligations to the public well i think it's fair to say that they are tipping the scale and and sometimes they do that deliberately there's certain information they don't want and the community standards will tell you exactly what those things are and then there are all the borderline cases etc so let them leave them at that right but that's just one thing another thing is to sort of stand between the tiers without sitting in either one of them and we have that discussed that a lot in the ministry of truth namely what we call shadow banning mm. now shadow banning is not the same as taking things down on any platform it's just to bury it deep so it's hard for the algorithms to find it and so and so that makes for a principal di- difference right because it's not like you're taking it off the platform it's still there you just have to dig for it very deeply and the algorithm won't necessarily pick it up in and by themselves but it's there so they in a certain sense you could say well it's not like we are banning things we're not like we are censoring things out but they're just not that easy to find but that's not on us that's just the way things work. And so we are not banning things. But shadow banning, mm-hmm. with the speed that things, with, with things that people are, are getting, uh, accessing the information, and also formulating their opinions, may I add, does not make for you sitting digging it around. So de facto, you are banning it or censoring it, but, uh, but it's still sort of around, right? And so that's a way to work around the problem of censoring. And I think we're going to see a lot of more of that uh, when when the EU and the American Congress are going to start putting packages on top on top of each other in terms of regulation, they're going to see if they can find the loopholes by which they, in a certain sense, obey the regulations. Yet, on the other hand, it's they still want to maintain the business model. And to be very blunt about it, again, and I know it's a simple point, but so far it's been characterizing humanity pretty well. If you're in doubt about people's motives and you don't want anything else, follow the money. I always think of that as like if a tree falls in a forest uh, and there's no one there to hear it, uh, it doesn't make a noise. That's like the shadow batting analogy, <laughs> right? You already mentioned TikTok, but I want to, and it's been all over the news and it, you know, there's a lot of, I mean, they've been trying to ban it in certain individual states here in the United States. I, I think, who was it? Montana or somebody just passed that law where they want to ban it. I don't know how they're going to enforce that, but they've been singled out a lot recently, you know, among all the social media platforms. And I think largely... Uh, you know, because of its close ties to the Chinese government. But is TikTok fundamentally worse or more dangerous than Facebook or YouTube or Twitter? I mean, don't they all just collect inordinate amounts of personal data and have the ability to exert influence on their users? 
Sure. Uh, from that perspective, the business model for TikTok is the same in as the, the, the social media platforms that we find in liberal democracies. Of course, uh, right now we have there are big tensions with China, and they have been very they have been very blunt about the way in which they use the data about your users, as we were talking about before as using it for the social credit system. And what's the point of that? The social credit system is to control your citizens, period. Yeah. And the Fr Chinese have been very blunt about that. That's what they want their social credit system right. to do for them. That does not sound very good in liberal democracies, right? Uh, so from that perspective, we don't want to get controlled by the state. Neither do we want to get controlled by social media platforms, as a matter of fact. But either way, right? So I think it's fair to say that what they do have that what TikTok does have is that they have a product which is to their users second to none. And why is it second to none? Because they gather all the information that they can and they feed it right back into the system and they don't care about these concerns that we might have in liberal democracies. So from that perspective, they do have an edge in terms of the way in which they can cater or to their particular, what should I say, segments of, of, of interested parties, whatever they are. And as far as I know, uh, that kind of usage of data is not something that we have on Facebook or TikTok or Facebook or some of the Western ones, As I, to the extent that I know. But I do know this, that they, they might not use it for this, but they do gather as much as they can, because as I said before, all data is credit information. So is is there a solution here? I mean, they've, some of the solutions that have been floated by the U.S. government is to have ByteDance, the company that owns TikTok, which is, you know, like any Chinese company will have ties, close ties to the government, because that's just kind of the way things work there. But selling that off or somehow having, an, you know, a non-Chinese version of this company, that, that that's that's when something that's been floated. These bans of the apps or, or blocking of the apps, I, I guess, I mean, I fully understand why, you know, government employees should not have these things, that sure. app on their devices. And I think the government is well within and it's rights to, well, obviously totally. within its rights to tell its employees not to have these on your government devices or in the government property. But is it practical to, to ban TikTok? I mean, what, what do you, is there a solution that you can think of to this problem? A lot of stuff has been floating around. But the idea of insisting on ByteDance selling it off to other parties would be like the Chinese government asking Coca-Cola to do something about their company in terms of what should be their owners. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure even the American federal government would say, that is not for China to decide where Coca-Cola is going to go with their company. Right. And the Chinese will say the same right, mm -hmm. for that particular model. So that is probably another way to go. But there are ways in which you can actually install a uniform measurement. So for instance, one, would be to say, look, you can't tap data unequivocally as much as you like. You can tap data, say, three days back in the on the agenda, and that's about it. And then you have to make do with that. That's going to mean something to us, too, because our search result is gonna, not going to be that nice. And the ads that we're being presented is not going to be as, as specific to us as they were before, et cetera, et cetera. So it's going to cost us something, mm -hmm. right? But, of course, there are also another one, and that is... We have a project going uh, with the University of Indiana, Blooming, uh, University of Indiana Bloomington, that we just finished a paper that we are sending out now, based on an idea I had some time ago. Namely, do you have a Facebook profile? Do I? I my business does. Okay. So, have you read those thirty-six pages <laughs> regarding the community standards, et cetera, et cetera? No. Okay. So there you have it. Right? Most of most of us have it. But if we had, we would have known there's a lot of stuff you're not allowed to do based those community standards. So what we were suggesting as a friction strategy ever so often that just when you're about to send something or, or, or log on to your profile, not every time, but arbitrarily at points in time, you were going to be presented with uh, a little quiz, a little pop quiz <laughs> as to questions on the community standards. And if you can answer those questions, then off you go to do go your merry way. And if not... You have to go back and study the standards until you can answer those questions. And that should, in principle, be to the interest of the users because they will understand the conditions under which they operate on that platform. That would be nice now since it's virtually public space. And in principle, it should be of interest to the social media platforms as well because then they apparently wouldn't have to do that much content automation because people would know the conditions under which they were operating on the system. So far, I presented it to the... Uh, to the Danish director of Facebook, and he was like, nah, 
You know, like that. But, sure. I mean, but, but in a certain sense, uh, you could do that. Right. So there are actually both um, amendments you could stick onto the platform or conditions that you could make uniform. So, of course, if TikTok can't spend used data, which is more than three days old, neither should Matter nor Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, what not have you. So there should be uniform rules across the board. And the idea of installing or insisting that there are friction strategies in do, introduced on these platforms to secure and ensure that the, that the users are aware of the conditions under which they operate, namely so basically using the community, community standards as friction strategies, that should in principle be a game a game winner for everybody, right? right. And that is something that you actually couldn't, you could just say basically, if you want to operate here, if you want to operate in this country, at least what we want to have is there are pop quizzes at arbitrary times where the users are familiarizing themselves with the way in which this platform operates. Yeah, friction strategies are interesting. We'll, we will definitely come back, back to that because I've heard some other interesting ones too that I think might have an effect. But before we leave the, the topic of TikTok, I, one of the things that drove me nuts that I only saw clips of the the, uh, the the poor guy from TikTok who was dragged in front of Congress to answer all their questions. And some of them were just asking. Five hours worth or what is it? Eight hours. Some of those right. questions were just ridiculous and really made, honestly, made us look bad. But what, what I couldn't get past was just the, the this blatant hypocrisy that we can't, and this is from both sides of the aisle, that we don't hold all these other companies to the same standard. Why are we not saying these things about Facebook? Why is this same body not producing a privacy policy that would achieve a lot of the things they're looking to do with TikTok, but would do it for all social media? I don't, I don't get that. What, I mean, you always say follow the money. Is, that, is it just lobbyists that are preventing this from happening? Well, I think uh, right now, of course, the, the, the tension between the U.S. and China sure. are immense. Yeah, so they, you might have to factor that into the equation oh, as sure. well. Yeah. Uh, once that is said, I think it's fair to say that the American lawmakers are actually right now working on various initiatives as to law packages that should be installed with these. And my guess would be that although right now they are hammering along on TikTok, but they, of course, have been hammering along on Meta as well early on, right? And so I think my guess is that once they install these packages, law packages, they're going to be uniformly applicable to whoever wants to operate in the country. And even the lawmakers realized both during the Facebook files, but also during the insurrection, that they are doing a lot more than just either constant moderation. They're, they are the arbiters of truth to a certain extent, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so from that perspective, that's not what we want. You don't want private enterprises to be the arbiters of truth, although they deny that they are, but de facto they are. And so I think what you will find once these law packages are coming to the boat, that they'll be uniformly applied. Right now, the TikTok guy is the fall guy, but... Early on, of course, Mark Zuckerberg was the fall guy. But you have to realize something about big tech. They don't have each other's backs, right? <laughs> That's not usually what you see. So if, right. one gets, so if one gets attacked, the others are going to run for cover. Yet when that particular person is off the hook, then when somebody else is on the hot seat, then the others are running for cover. So they are not, <laughs> they are not basically supporting each other, mm -hmm. which should for Congress be good because then you can play command if you can play divide and conquer. Right, right. You mentioned adding a little bit of friction to the process, and, and I've heard some interesting other options for this I want to get your take on. For, for instance, uh, making it not so easy to retweet. I don't know if it was in your book or somewhere else, but somebody, whoever invented the retweet, it was like where you could just with a click yeah. of a button without doing anything else, very low effort, you could just immediately turn around and share something with, with all your followers. Right. It became a problem because that led to the virality of people had no effort to like look and do it first. I like how Twitter actually eventually had this thing where you click retweet, but if... Yeah, but if you but if you didn't read the article, it's like, do you want to read this article before you retweet it? You right. know, they actually put a little bit of friction in there. Yeah. But like one of the things people that I've heard recommended to stop spam is to, is to start charging people for emails. You know, maybe not for one email, but after 10 or after 100 emails, maybe you start charging a penny, a sliding scale. After a thousand emails, you can just spend a buck, up, you know, sure. add a little that kind of friction or take away the like button or maybe have the like that's button. That's not going to happen. <laughs> or have the like button, but don't you can't see who liked it because there's a yeah. lot of virtue signals sure. too, right? There's a lot of sure. people who want yeah. to say, I want people to know that I like that. But, you know, if the fact that I liked it didn't matter, I couldn't get points for that. Maybe that would be something. What, what do you think of some of these other ideas? Sure, but I mean, there's a lot of good ideas out there. And one of the things that we've already seen installed, right? So one of the things that we've seen on Instagram is that you can only see the, the most... Uh, the 100 most recent likes of a particular thing. And that's basically to see, and you can't necessarily see who they're from. And that is basically to make sure that 
people don't get uh, concerned about whether or not people liked or if they can see who they liked, if they didn't like, was that cyberbullying or whatever it was. Right. So, so, so that's, you can, you can definitely do something like that. And you realize one thing that basically you should look at all these retweeting or liking or emojis sharing or whatever you want to call it. These are basically, what should I say? They are, they are vanity fairs, right? In many ways, they are they are a measure of your social recognition, right? Uh, on a transparent exchange, yeah, uh, or apparently transparent exchange. Because I can see how many likes you have on your latest post, and you can see how many shares I have on my earlier post. One, and so they are basically vanity fairs. Now, how do you control vanity fairs? Well, you control vanity fairs by not necessarily letting people know how many people are subscribing to this or how much of reach it does have, et cetera, et cetera. So there are a million ways from Sunday where if you truncate the exchange in the sense that you can't really be told how much social capital I apparently got from my last post and how much you got for your last, then clearly you could do something about it. But you should realize that if you do these sorts of things, and I only applaud if you do, you should realize that they have something to do. They will influence, they will affect the earnings. Sure. Period. For sure. Because there's less of an incentive to see if you can't see how much social capital you gained on your last post. Look at the entire influencer culture is in many ways based on that particular principle. So another thing that's been in the news a lot lately is chat GPT and AI in general. And of course, AI has been around for decades, but there's been some pretty significant advances lately when this chat GPT is, is one of them, these large language models. And so a lot of what you see on the news is they're worried about, you know, teachers are worried that kids are going to use these things to generate essays and cheat on exams. It's obviously some people are worried for their jobs that this is the, this is this new technology is going to replace them. And I think some content providers certainly have risks there. But for me, uh, you know, what I'm maybe more concerned about and what I want to get your take on is how this technology may be used to create more believable fake news, uh, for example, to take these algorithms that are good at maximizing engagement and take them to the next level. Are you at all concerned about that? And if so, in what way? Sure, I am. Uh, and, re and, and so are the big tech companies. I was recently at a conference where a, very, a, t a, a particular speaker there presided some very interesting information about Face, uh, excuse me, about Microsoft's own take on their on their AI initiative, and the same actually went for Google and I believe also Amazon. But uh, don't count me on Amazon. That they are worried exactly that their that their AI initiatives can be used for exactly that. And if we take fake news basically to be either Harry Frankfurt's bullshit or downright lies, but dressed up as journalism and so simulating truthfulness, then clearly there is a market for. This sub, these subprime information products, which they really are, in a market that's being run by an attention economy. So you should look at fake news as basically an information product that is it's subprime in the sense that it's pretty far from the remote from the truth, but it has another quality, namely to, to attract a, scores and scores of attention independently of it being true, which brings us to one of the mottos of this book, maybe whatever is viral is not necessarily true and whatever is true is not necessarily viral. Mm -hmm. And so from that perspective, if you look at it from a purely market perspective, the information market is not an efficient market in which once people, when the market is very liquid, people exchanges their beliefs and opinions and idea on the marketplace of ideas, then in the end, the, uh, the good products will survive and the bad will get weeded out, giving the liquidity of people exchanging their opinion on this market. That is not the way it works. The market is not efficient that way. So Adam Smith's invisible hand does not come out and pick out the bad products in this market, as far as we can tell for now. Right. And so either you regulate your way out of this, but ChatGPT can certainly be used to perfect some information products, which are subprime in terms of information quality, but on the other hand, can attract scores and scores of, in, uh, of attention, especially if ChatGPT is also hooked up to data about the way in which we behave online. Then you've got yourself your magnificent model for selling fake news products. I'm a technologist. I love my technology. I, I think ChatGPT is actually really cool and it's got an amazing promise. Could, can this same tool... Do you think will it have opportunities to help us in this situation? Will, will this, certainly. How might these AI tools help us? 
Okay, so there take people with different, different with various kind of disabilities, right? Or so 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 that could be either yeah, reading disorders, it could be blindness, could be a lot of things where these things could be very very helpful. And even if you don't have disabilities, it could still be very helpful. But and I might be a little old fashioned here, right? But I'm I'm a logician or a theoretical mathematician by training. So for instance, I teach logic at at the University of Copenhagen. I do that right now, as a matter of fact. So they go through natural deduction, calculi, and propositional calculus, and proofs, and whatnot. And one of the things that's pretty interesting to me is that ever since Herodotus, who is like 500 years before Christ, said, well, knowledge is a double capacity. On the one hand, knowledge is encyclopedic. It's what you can read in books or you can read on the web, et cetera, et cetera. That's one thing. And the other thing is that knowledge is also a skill. It's a toolbox. And so when I teach my students logic, if you do natural deduction calculus, sometimes you have to make assumptions to get the proof to roll. But you can't ask chat GBT for that because that actually requires a little bit of ingenuity. Mm. Not only that, it requires experience with the toolbox mm -hmm. of the inference rules that you're using. And my students in the beginning of the course, they sort of think that knowledge is like a meme. You can just read it and you get it. <laughs> but knowledge is not a meme that way. It's mm -hmm. also a toolbox. So I think it's fair to say that if we can complete the tools of our students for the future, then ChatGPT could be a wonderful, wonderful thing. To me, it's always been like, well, you know, it might be 10% talent and the rest is just hard work. Now, in terms of ChatGPT, it's also 10% challenge for the, G the chat GPT, but it's 90% hard work for the ones who want to use it for something that would actually be useful for constructing a bridge on the one hand or and, uh, dreaming up a new model of democracy on the other hand. In other words, if you take a bad programmer and get the, get the, the bad programmer aided by chat GPT, you're going to get terrible code. But if you take a good programmer mm -hmm. and you pair that person up with ChatGPT, you're going to get some wonderful code. But we can't write ourselves out of the equation. My biggest concern with this is not that ChatGPT or any other AI mechanism is going to be more intelligent than we are. After all, they're still running on the on natural language processing uh, and big corporate of uh, a big corporate of of text that we have been generating. So I'm not necessarily worried about that, but I am worried that they will take our weaknesses and exploit them in terms of either biases or impatience or the hunger for social capital. Da, 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 yeah. da, da. We got plenty of weaknesses that can be used. And, and that is not too far off. As you know, in the book, uh, the Ministry of Truth, we have a whole chapter on what we call the clandestine casino. And that is basically the way in which big tech have been using the tips and tricks of the trade of the casino industry to keep engagement going and flowing. And that's what we actually found from BJ Fogg at the 90s course that he had on, at Stanford where Elon Musk took a course and the guy who started Hewlett Packard and all the others. So they very well know how they should actually use the tips and tricks of the trade of variable uh, reward psychology to keep people playing on the platforms. That I am extremely concerned about, that the AIs can use our weaknesses to basically dominate us more than they become smarter than we are. Right, right. Yeah, the, the whole casino design thing is amazing. You know, it's making it a maze, making it hard to see the exits, making the kind of the, keeping the fresh air circulating, though they still allow smoking, which drives me nuts. Right. Uh, you know, having the waitresses <laughs> come to you to offer the drink so you don't have to get away from your one arm bandit, you know, so they can keep you there playing or the blackjack table. No clocks anywhere, no windows, you know, it's all these kind of dark patterns that were pioneered by some of these industries that are, yeah, it's it's just new days to apply those same things. And they have been implemented, I mean, the casino industry have had 100 years or something right. like that to actually both make these and then adjust them and finalize them and optimize them, et cetera, et cetera. And now basically the same tricks are being used on the social media platforms. And the principle, the basic principle on which they operate is that, very uh, variable reward psychology. That's what we found from B.F. Skinner in the 30s. That's the one that one arm Jack is all about. If I don't know whether or not I'm going to get a reward, what do I do? Well, I keep trying until I see if I can get a reward, even if the odds are stacked against me. And that principle has been implemented on the iPhones or smartphones long time ago. Right. Nobody, you don't, you don't really know whether somebody liked your your latest post, right? So you check. And here's an interesting thing, by the way. This is a 
piece of information that you might not know, namely, uh, during COVID, we realized that the average human touches its own face about 3,000 times a day. Hmm. Yeah, that's the reason why we needed to use hand sanitizer and and wipe and, and, and wipe our hands every time, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There is research out there that goes to show that the average user of a cell phone touches their cell phone 2,600 times a day. It's just about as much as we touch ourselves in the face. And it's definitely more than you touch your partner on a daily basis. Just to say that this particular, these smartphones here are now basically a limb. Yeah. But it's right. a limb transmitting data about you to a third party that could be used to sell ads to somebody that you don't know, nor where your data is being stored. Right. So it's not like a, it's not a prosthetic limb that way. It's a significantly more advanced prosthetic. And it might not it might not always do you good because it's installed for a different set of purposes than to actually help you getting around. Right, and that that's actually one of the things that from uh, Orwell's 1984, which of course is with also the inspiration of your book title, where the, uh, even Orwell didn't foresee that the telescreens a could fit in your pocket and that b people would willingly and like obsessively carry them with them everywhere, included to the bathroom. Right. <laughs> that's exactly true and so there's a reason why we call it the ministry of truth and I th i'm happy that you just touch on that and of course in in orwell's 1984 there is a particularly ministry of truth installed but it specializes in lies and propaganda now we don't say that big tech is doing the same we're not saying that they are the ministry for lies and propaganda but what we are saying is that when you look at it qualitatively and quantitatively, they are arbiters of truth. De facto right. are the arbiters of truth because they stack the information that you see in a particular way. And that is not only based on chronology, it's based on amplifying the model by which they make an ad revenue. Right. Or can, or can predict behavior or both. All right, so here's a philosophical question for you. How much responsibility do we have here, you know, as citizens, as consumers, you know, can we and should we be actively trying to improve our digital literacy and critical thinking skills, for example, should we be, I, I, I certainly believe we should be teaching this as part of any standard education curricula, but I, it's not really there, but even adults after the, I mean, there's a lot of people sure. of us that are not going to go back to school anytime soon. We need to know that stuff too. Should we be doing that? I'm guessing your answer is yes. And if so, how? Okay, I think we, the answer is yes, rhetorically yes. And the reason is basically that what we want to educate are enlightened citizens that can take, that make their own autonomous decisions about what property to vote for, where to live, what job, what job to have, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a, that's a yes. And, and the way in which we talk about that in the book, there's a whole chapter, it's called What Now? We talk about mobilizing along three axes. One is one called individual mobilization, that's digital literacy. And we did a lot of that here in Denmark, our, at my center. We actually provided a national program for digital literacy, teaching high school kids and younger about everything from attention economics to clandestine casinos, social proof, uh, influence, et cetera, et cetera. So, so that's part of the curriculum here, too. Uh, that's, that's one thing. Then, of course, another thing is what we call institutional mobilization, which we also, for instance, saw along when we had COVID. Uh, Facebook went to went together with WHO to 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 actually counter some of the misinformation out there, and then there is the ideological mobilization, read uh, uh, policy making, right? So there are mm -hmm. at least three legs to this uh, to this sort of mobilization that we are talking about. And yes, of course, if you look at it, and you were talking about individual mobilization, I, digital literacy, if you want. Now, you know. There are a million ways from Sunday by which you can try to insult people, right, about race or color or whatnot. But there is one particular place where you always get people to get really angry, and that's when you insult their intelligence. Hmm. Nobody likes to get insulted by their intelligence, and nobody likes to be the lemming being, being fluted around by somebody else. And so basically, if you can show people that sometimes you are lemming along, does it because basically because somebody is inviting you into a casino that you don't really want to be in, insulting your intelligence is always a bad idea. And so if you don't have any other incentive to actually become digital literate, it's basically not to get insulted on your intelligence, which should be a good enough argument. Because I think it's fair to say, right, that if you ask people living in liberal democracies as to whether or not they consider themselves autonomous, uh, self-deciding, determinate beings, 
I think the standard answer is to most for most people be yeah you know give or take. I mean there might be there might be some holes here here and there, but a little you know averagely speaking yes I I consider myself such. And if you look at the way in which the social media they are not necessarily there to stimulate your autonomy, but they are st- they are they are around there not to stimulate your autonomy necessarily, but to create engagement and what we talked about so much before. Of course, uh, that doesn't go for China themselves because the opium mo- model of their TikTok is something that they export to the Western world and they use it for a completely separate, different set of purposes back in China. And so from that perspective, sometimes it's also, I'm wondering, right, why there's this, this idea of basically selling French fries to people any day of the week and twice on Sunday, whether why why this big social media platform finds that's is sufficient to them. In a certain sense, I find it very unambitious. Yeah. Why not start to be educational? Why not take response, more responsibility for democracy? Why not? Why not? Why not? Because basically, if it's just a matter of making money, there are two certain sure way of doing is sell porn and weapons or both. <laughs> yeah. In so many words, right? Yeah, yeah. 200 armed conflicts in the world, right, as we speak. Landmines are great. And they're great because they can be shipped. They don't have an expiration date. And whoever the customers or clients are, either dead or they don't care. So go ahead, knock yourself up. Or the same goes for porn. So basically, just to say, if you are more ambitious as a societal actor, then clearly either these social media platforms, if they're not only in it for the buck, could actually take response, more responsibility. It strikes me as a much more ambitious business model than just being in it for the buck. Yeah. Do you and, think- these, and we have seen a little bit of this, just a little bit. Just, and then I'll be quiet. Then you remember when um, when Mark Zuckerberg was in the Senate and uh, and could and Okasha Cortez got him to admit that you could buy a fake news campaign on Facebook if you wanted to. Then what was the reaction from Jack Dorsey from Twitter the four days after that? He banned all political advertising on Twitter because and he had the the ten theses of Jack Dorsey, which are also in the Ministry of Truth book where he goes, if you can buy your way to political influence, then clearly we do have a problem with democracy. And so you see a little bit of societal awareness or ambition, at least you have seen a little bit. It's a little hard to figure out exactly what Musk is doing with, with, uh, with uh, yes. what's my call it, with, with Twitter these days, but uh, that's maybe right. it. It might, might be for a different rainy day. <laughs> and, and we could easily fill another hour podcast. I, I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, that this is just a maturity thing that as a society, this is kind of still kind of new to us. And, and, you know, kind of like we all know the Nigerian print scam. Now we recognize it for what it is. I'm hoping that we're all getting a little bit better just through osmosis and through news stories about these things that we're kind of, you know, we're learning that, okay, this, this might not be true. Maybe I should not you know, repost this. Maybe I should think about this. Maybe I should just not pay attention. Maybe I should get off my screens for a little bit too. We'll see if we get there. As we wrap up, I always like to, you know, try to give some hope to the audience and some actionable tips. What do you have any recommendations for, you know, how we can improve our, you know, how we can make things better on social media today, given what we have now, we don't have the privacy laws, but given where we're at today, what we, what can we do? And then kind of looking forward to the future, how else can we make things better as consumers and citizens? You know, how do we bring about the change that we're looking for? Okay. So first of all, I think it's fair to say that if you're bored, don't feed the beast. Hmm. Insofar as to say, when you're standing at a bus stop, you don't know exactly what to do. Don't start scrolling on your iPhone. Just hmm. leave it there. Have a thought or coffee or both. Mm-hmm. Uh, just to say, because as long as you're on, you're feeding the beast and you're basically just bolstering their, their power every time you log on. So if you don't have anything else to do, don't look at your iPhone. Don't put on the iPad. Have a thought or a coffee or have them both. That's one. Another thing is you have to realize one thing. That's what being capitalized on is your most valuable cognitive resource, your attention. That is basically what's being capitalized on. Think of a world in which you don't can pay, you cannot pay attention. And by the way, remember the wording, you pay with attention. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It is something that you pay with in, resp- in return for something. So whenever you engage with your attention, it's on a bilateral agreement basis that receives something in return. And what do you receive? Information. Question. Is it worth your attention, paying your attention for this kind of information? After all, it's your, more, it's your most valuable cognitive resource. So think of it as if this is the most valuable thing you got. 
Mm. What are you going to spend it on? <laughs> and there's only 24 hours in a day and you still have to sleep and you still have to do a lot of other stuff. Right. So it's a very scarce research, a resource. And you should realize that this particular insight is back from 1971. Herbert Simon, professor of psychology at Carnegie Mellon University, where I did a lot of my PhD studies. Back in 1971, he said, in an information-rich world, the wealth of information means the dearth of something else. It will be a scarcity of whatever it is that information consumes. But what information consumes is pretty obvious. It, con it consumes the attention of its recipients. And there you have it. That is basically, that's the new oil. Attention is the new oil. So be very careful with what you got. Okay? Now, if you so, so it's reminding ourselves that what is basically the driving force of all of this is something that is most the most valuable research that you have as a human being. So pay attention to what you pay your attention on. One, mm -hmm. then looking forward, things are changing. I mean, realize that the model by which the social media platforms have been making their trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars, that model was installed in 2001. It's 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. right? it's, it's very recent. And so... It, and then it took us 20, 15 years to figure out exactly what the model was. And even back in 2018, Orrin Hatch, the, the senator from Utah, who's, of course, now unfortunately dead, he didn't understand the model. And that was only four years ago. Yeah. And that is not a reflection on Orrin Hatch. It's just a reflection of the fact that the political system didn't really understand what was going on. So, in other words, our realization about how this model works is very recent. Mm -hmm. And legislation is always behind time, behind in time. Oh, yeah. So we are seeing some legislative initiatives that will that would actually do something. The EU have just introduced the Digital Service Act, the Digital Market Act. Now they're looking for AI. The uh, the American Congress is doing the same thing. So we're going to see regulation on this basis. So I'm in a certain sense, I'm pretty optimistic about it. Between the individual mobilization, the institutional mobilization, and lawmaking. But realize that this is going to take a while. We're not going to fix this problem overnight. We're talking maybe a generation or something, uh, just to say, because these are systemic problems, just like the climate crisis. And, and World Economic Forum have been out to say that, that misinformation on the web should not be considered a global challenge on par with climate change and all the other issues, basically because they can democracies can erupt because of it. And so basically we are talking big systemic problems and they're going to take some time to solve, but we are getting aware and there are, there are measures that we can install even for ourselves. The fact that some things are easy online, that there is no friction, is not a quality sign. It's basically a sign of the fact that somebody wants to make it easy, a frictionless experience for them, not you, right. to make more money. Right. <laughs> All right, Vincent, thank you so much for coming on today. That was fascinating. We could have talked easily for another two hours, I'm sure. So we'll have to have you back and, and, and delve into some of these things again, because I'm sure this is a dynamic situation. There will be new things to talk about. So uh, again, Vincent, thanks so much for coming on the show. That was great. Thank you, sir. Thank you for having me. Thanks again to Vincent for coming on the show. I actually heard about this several months ago. I think someone from... PR was reached out to me with a, with a, with a copy of the book and I started reading it. Uh, I admit I still have not finished it, but it's really not that long. It's a, it's a short read. It's a dense read. There's a lot of really good information in there. And I would definitely recommend you checking the book out. And we will probably read that at some point for my patron book club, which I'll come back to in a second. But before we get to that, I will say if, if you have not uh, read 1984 by George Orwell, that's definitely worth a read. It was written in 1949. And it really is prescient in a lot of ways, though, like I said, he got while he got some things very close to right. The source of the propaganda was not exactly as he had envisioned it. Now, there was a 1984 movie made as well, which I have seen personally. I didn't enjoy it as much. I mean, if you're kind of an artsy person, you might like it. But I think just from a privacy perspective, I personally enjoyed the book better than I liked the movie. So coming back to the patron book club, uh, I started a book club on privacy and, and infosec and security topics, which may not sound exciting on the, on its surface, but a lot of the books we pick are very good books in the field, and we're doing some fiction as well as nonfiction. And right now we are reading The Cult of the Dead Cow, 
CDC, which is a classic original group of hackers and the, the group that coined the term hacktivism. Uh, I'm finding the book fascinating. And so I'm reading it. I wanted to read it before I went to DEF CON, the big hacker conference in August. And so far, it has not disappointed. So anyway, if you're interested in joining our book club, uh, become a patron and check that out. Go to patreon.com and search for Firewalls Don't Stop Dragons. You can go to fdsd.me slash support to find more information about that. And of course, there's a link in the show notes. And as always, my patrons will be getting some bonus podcast content, some private patron-only stuff that comes out on Thursdays, and that will be coming up with some more Q&A with Vincent. And I've got some great shows on the horizon. I've got two interviews already in the can, as they say, ready to be edited and posted. One was with Andre Omiko from Privacy for Cars and their wonderful new free online privacy tool. And it's very timely. I just brought my first EV electric vehicle, uh, which has a ridiculous amount of privacy concerns. Oh my God, I'll be talking about that at some point. I also just spoke with Aaron Myrick, who's from the Aerospace Corp. And we're going to be talking about hacking satellites in space and the upcoming Hackasat 4 contest at DEF CON, which is designed kind of like a bug bounty thing to try to find these problems so we can get them fixed. I got two more interviews being recorded this week. I don't want to jinx them in case something comes up, but they will be a lot of fun as well. And I'm working on some other really cool interviews leading up to the DEF CON hacking conference. So lots of great stuff. If you have not subscribed, do that right now. And that way you won't miss any of that. All right, that'll do it this week. Take care, everybody. We'll have news again for you next week. And until then, as always, stay safe out there and don't get caught with your drawbridge down. <laughs>